I will say this about investing. Everything you do learn is cumulative. What I learned at 20 is useful. Equity Mates, episode number 25. This is a podcast about breaking down the world of investing to make it easier for you guys. And as always, I am joined with my equity buddy, Ren. How are you going, mate? I'm good, Bryce. How are you going? Good, good. Very well. Excited to be back, as always. I think this is going to be a good episode. We've got Toby Carlyle lined up um, for this week, and he's a pretty well-renowned value-based investor um, who you were lucky enough to sit down with and have a, a great chat. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about him? Yeah, so Toby Carlyle is an Australian who has, I guess, made it big in America, you would say. He started out in studying law at University of Queensland and uh, on a journey that he takes us through has ended up as a deep value investor in California. So he's got an interesting personal story, but what uh, I found particularly interesting, he has written a number of books on value investing and has done a lot of research on different value investing strategies and he's written a number of sort of quasi-academic textbooks. Uh, The most well-known is Deep Value and a lot of people in the investing community really uh, respect his writing and the back testing he's done. But he recognized that some of the stuff he was writing wasn't very accessible and he's written a new book called The Acquirer's Multiple and what he's essentially tried to do is distill a lot of the lessons from some of his more technical books into a book that uh, is quite easy to read and is sort of explains the concepts that drive his investing. To give you an idea, of, uh, I bought the book in preparation for the interview and actually read it in a day. But you're a fast yeah. reader. <laughs> no, it, it was all the book, I promise you. <laughs> um, no, but the book, it, it was very interesting. He doesn't just talk about the theory. He has a number of real-world practical examples of Uh, different types of investors and how they've approached markets and some really interesting stories. Um, Hopefully, everyone enjoys the interview as much as I enjoyed the book. Yeah, nice. Well, I think uh, he speaks strongly to our philosophy of investing, so um, this should provide some great insight to uh, the listeners out there who are also intrigued in the value mindset. Yeah, definitely. And before we go, uh, we should give another plug to our competition. Yeah. How are we going on it so far? Yeah, great guns. Uh, Spots are filling up fast, not that there are unlimited. (laughs) It's it's unlimited. But but there are, entrants are increasing. Uh, Yeah, so just a reminder to anyone who hasn't entered already, there is a possibility for, well, there's a chance for you guys to win $500 to invest thanks to Belmont Securities. We've been lucky enough to team up with them and they are giving you the chance to win um, $500 cash to invest in any way you would like uh, through their platform. Um, That also will be covering your brokerage fees for the first trade and then from there on in they'll um, be giving some sort of discounted brokerage so fantastic opportunity for anyone who hasn't yet started investing but would love to five hundred dollars is the perfect amount to dip your toe in the water Um, but also if you do have an investing account with another provider or with belmont uh, that competition is still open to you guys and this can just be in addition to what you've already got so Jump online, www.equitymates.com uh, forward slash win500 uh, or follow our Facebook page and Twitter account and you'll find the entrance details in there. So jump on board. It's a fantastic opportunity. The competition won't be running for too much longer. Um, so don't miss the chance to win $500. This could be the start of your investing journey. And even though our entry numbers are growing faster than the price of Bitcoin, You've got to be in it to win it, so yes. <laughs> give yourself a chance. Exactly. So jump in while you have the opportunity to, because this won't be around forever. Anyway, so without further ado, um, this is Alex sitting down with Toby Carlisle. Yeah, enjoy. Equity, 
Toby, thanks so much for joining us. Here at Equity Mates, we're fascinated with how peop- the people we interviewed got started in investing. So can you tell our listeners what got you first interested in investing and how you got started? Thanks very much for having me. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's something that I'm fascinated in too. That's something in the in the new book, um, I've, I look at a lot of other, everybody who's in the book, I look at how they got started. So I look at how Buffett got started, how Icahn got started, how David Einhorn got started and how uh, Loeb got started. Um, I came to it through a kind of funny, uh, funny way. I was interested in value investing at uni. Uh, I studied business and law at UQ. Um, I didn't have any um, kind of, uh, my family's not a, like none of them are stock market people, didn't own any shares or anything like that, but I was just sort of interested in it. I was looking for some sensible way of investing and a friend read security analysis and gave it to me and I, I read it, but I, it's, it's a very tough book to read. And the version that I read was the original one, which is a really, really tough book to read, but it was a good thing to have read it. Um, because when I started working as a lawyer, um, I was in M&A and it was the early 2000s. So I just sort of got there. I think I started in April 2000, which was like basically the absolute top of the dot-com bubble. And it collapsed from there. And I watched all of these companies that had raised a lot of money, dot-coms, uh, in Australia that had raised money that, you know, they were just they were just burning cash. Like they didn't really have a business model. They weren't, they weren't making any money at all they were selling you know on like an online department store that was losing money with every single sale and there was this bloke uh farouk faruki i think his name was he's the he's still operating in australia he's the desert raider and he came in and he got control of a few of these um, little cash box companies that were burning cash just shot the business and all of a sudden he had like a listed company that had cash in it and then he used it to keep on going and buying these other companies i'd read um Buffett's letters and in those letters he talks about buying wonderful companies at fair prices but I was looking at these acquisitions that these that this guy was doing and other guys like him and I just couldn't I couldn't figure out what he was seeing in them you know of course it was the cash but at the time I kind of didn't uh did just didn't have the tools to kind of analyze what was happening but I did remember because I'd read that security analysis uh book that had that um had that chapter in it about liquidations and shareholders getting control of companies i went back and had a look at that and it talks about graham's net net sub liquidation value strategy where basically you try and get you try and buy the stock in a company for less than the liquid assets that it has so less than the cash and the inventory and the receivables and you try and buy it then two-thirds of that of that valuation relative to the to the market cap so I sort of understood what he was doing and I just thought next time that comes around, I'm going to be – next time the stock market crashes and these kind of things are around, I'm going to go out and I'm going to try and buy some of these stocks because I know that somebody's going to come in and take these companies out. So I worked worked as a lawyer in Australia, worked as a lawyer in San Francisco, came back to Australia to be general counsel of uh, a company that was listed on the stock exchange called Pipe Networks, which got taken out uh, by TPG. And uh, I went and sat in the office of this uh, investor, Troy Harry, and he had um, a company called um, Trojan Investment Management that had a listed investment company called Trojan Equity. And that was basically what he did. He'd go and get buy a stake in these companies and then try and get them to either pay the money out or buy back some stock or do something to, to improve the valuation. And just because I, I didn't want to have any conflict with what he was doing, I started looking in the States. This was kind of late 2008 when the stock market was really beaten up in the States and it was it was falling like 15% a quarter. And I found a whole, there were, you know, like a thousand of these companies trading below net current asset value. And so I went and bought a basket of them, you know, doing this analysis where I look for them, look for an activist on the board or activists trying to get control. They'd file the 13D as they call it in the States. And it was trading below net current asset value. And I bought a whole lot of these and then, um, sort of my portfolio was flat through kind of the fourth quarter of 2008 and then it might have been up like 12% through the f- first quarter of 2009 when the market was down like 15%. And then from the bottom in 2009, it was up 250% in the next six months. And I thought, I'm really, really good at this stuff. <laughs> but I, I had this, uh, I went back and I looked at um, 
all of the stocks that I thought about buying, and I looked, and and it was like a, I think it was like 120 stocks that passed the criteria of mine. But then for whatever reason, I hadn't kind of put, hadn't bought them, and that those 120 stocks were up 750 percent together. Wow! And so I basically used all of my own genius, you know, to take two th- to to miss two thirds of the returns. So I started on this different process. Basically, uh, Trojan Equity got wound up. I went and raised a little bit of money from friends and family and from people I'd worked for in the past to set up an Australian fund. And it did it, it beat the market pretty handily for the next two years. My wife is a Los Angelino, and so we moved back to the States to get married and have kids and uh, set up my own fund here. I met a, I, I met a, a guy, Red Deep Value, and he's now my business partner. And we've um, we've basically got two strategies. We have this special situation net, you know, special situation deep value uh, hedge fund that raises money from high net worth individuals and uh, endowments and institutions and things like that. And that's run in a traditional hedge fund manner. And then we have these quantitative portfolios that the objective is to turn that into um, some sort of listed vehicle so that any uh, any investor can invest in that. And that'll be, hopefully, we'll have some announcements about that in the next 12 months. But that's basically, that's my story. Yeah, wow. It's a, it's a fascinating story. And you started with so many activist investors and you've, you've made a complete pivot, I guess, to serious deep value situations. So do you, do, you still, do you still stay on the lookout for activists or do you purely screen for deep value and then just invest in all of them? So um, activism and deep value go hand in hand. So the, just, just so I, I can explain the difference between deep value and probably kind of more the, the type of value investing that Warren Buffett does. So there aren't in the stock market something like 5% of assets are in some sort of value portfolio um, in the States. Of those 5%, the very vast majority of them are in a kind of Buffett style portfolio. So when I say Buffett style, if you read his letters, he talks about investing in wonderful companies at fair prices. And what he means by that is very profitable companies that are kind of uh, a little bit undervalued. If you're a deep value guy, what you're looking for is uh, not a wonderful company. They tend to have fairly busted businesses. They're not making money or it's a cyclical business like steel, or airlines or things like that, that. When they go well, they go really, really well. When they go badly, they go really bad. And the risk is when you're buying these things that they go to zero. So you're looking for the way that you kind of get around that is you want balance sheet strength. So you want cash on the balance sheet or assets that they can liquidate, things like that. I look for... Uh, things that don't necessarily have great businesses, but they are still making some money and they've got great balance sheets and they can survive because when they turn around, they really rip. They go very well. And there's sort of there's, there's more of those types of companies on the stock market. That's about 96% of the companies on the stock market of that style. Uh, 4% are kind of the Buffett style, which is funny because that's where most of the assets are. Yeah, and so yeah. they tend to be more highly valued. So... If you're in these deep value companies, there there's kind of three ways that you, you, you get your money back out. Either the business just sort of recovers, which most of the time that's what happens. And it's called mean reversion, basically. The thing is as busted as it's going to get. Management isn't just standing there or sitting on their hands. You know, They're trying to fix it. The weak hands kind of get shaken out of the industry. And then the stronger companies survive and then they go very well because they've got a period of time where there's no one. There's no real competition. So they're making pretty good money. Um, then the other two ways that you kind of get your money out, a leverage buyout firm, private equity firm comes along and they buy them. That happens kind of occasionally. It's like 2 or 3% of the opportunities that that happens to, or they attract an activist. And so an activist is sort of, um, they're looking for particular types of things, but they think they can do better than current management. When they come in, often there's a little bump around them coming in and then they tend to um, focus the, the mind of the management, focus the mind of the company on running it more for shareholders than it might have been previously. And so you find that they do big buybacks. So the, the company might get sold, all these sort of things that, that generate pretty good returns. So activism is, it is a small part of what, uh, you know, of, of the investment process that we use, but 
it's um, it's still a very key part because it's often how these very undervalued companies, the situations get resolved. Yeah, nice one. So I guess that leads naturally into your new book where you've sort of written about your investment philosophy and and how you invest. So it's called The Acquirer's Multiple. Uh, can you explain what you mean by The Acquirer's Multiple and, and how you calculate it for these companies? Sure. So the most successful book about value investing over the last decade is a book called The Little Book That Beats the Market by Joel Greenblatt. Really fantastic book. I read it when it first came out, like the end of 2006 or whatever it was. I was in San Francisco. I got the book, read it. Loved it because it was a great explanation of what Warren Buffett is doing, which is the the wonderful companies at fair prices. So Joel Greenblatt, who's a great investor in his own right, he went through and he analyzed these things quantitatively. And he said, what's a wonderful company? That's a company that earns very high returns on invested capital. So what that means is that it makes a dollar, uh, more than a dollar of, you know, lots of, lots of profit per asset you know, per dollar of asset invested in the company. So they're very profitable companies with not much in the way of assets. And the reason that's attractive is it allows them to grow very rapidly and kind of throw off cash while they're doing it. And then wonderful companies at fair prices. So the second part of the equation is this fair price idea. Uh, Greenblatt calls it the earnings yield. If you go through Buffett's letters, you find him talking about EBIT operating earnings, EBIT operating income, and he says that's something that he tracks very closely. I've got a couple of quotes that he says in my book. Basically, um, you're looking at operating income is basically the bottom line, net profit after tax, and then you're adding back in interest and taxes. And the reason that you do that is interest payments are tax deductible. So they kind of, they, they, if the company's paying a lot of interest, it might be paying less tax. If it's paying no interest, it might be paying more tax. Basically, it makes an apples to apples comparison possible between different companies with different capital structures. And then that uh, that is examined against the enterprise value of a company. So if, if uh, you know what the market capitalization is, that's the, the number of shares that a company has on issue multiplied by the share price, that's the market cap. If you're only looking at market cap, you're missing uh, how much debt the company has, and if it has anything anything else that's sort of debt-like. So other things that are debt-like are preference shares or in the States an underfunded pension or uh, a minority interest, which is another, another company or another business might hold a little part of the business. So basically enterprise value adds all those things together and it tells you whether you – sometimes companies have ca- more cash than debt and so they're actually a little bit cheaper than they look. Sometimes they're carrying a lot of debt and they're much more expensive than they look. So then you look at this enterprise value against the operating earnings and that gives you um, how cheap they are. So Greenblatt ranks them on how good they are and how cheap they are, takes a combined ranking and that's what he calls the magic formula. When he tests that, he finds that that beats the market really well. So I partnered with a bloke in 2012 um, who's a – he was a PhD student at um, the Booth School of Business in the States, which is the best sort of quantitative business school in the States regarded as the best quantitative business school. Um, we tested all of these different fundamental measures um, to see which ones sort of still worked. And we tested the magic formula as part of that process just because it's a simple quantitative methodology. And we found that it beat the market. It didn't beat the market as much as uh, Greenblatt had said that it did, but it definitely beat the market. And we looked at it over the full data set that we had, which went back to sort of 1963 through to about 2013. But I found it kind of a really fascinating um, idea, like why does the magic formula beat the market? And then this other kind of very unusual thing that if you take away the the wonderful company part, if you take away the return on invested capital, if you just look at Greenblatt's earnings yield, you find that that beats the magic formula. And it doesn't just beat it on a raw basis, it beats it on a risk-adjusted basis. So there are risk-adjusted measures, sharp ratio, Sortino ratio, which basically look at how much the portfolio moves around relative to how much it makes. And it turns out that this is sort of just buying these things that are deeply undervalued, gets you better performance. So the book, Deep Value, which came out in 2014, basically I looked at the reasons why these really undervalued companies tended to beat the market and to beat um, uh, 
magic formula type companies. And so the most recent book, The Acquirer's Multiple, is sort of a simplified version of deep value. And I've discussed some other things that I've found in my books and things that I've found since then. It's a really simple explanation of what is sort of wrong with the magic formula and why the acquirer's multiple, which is just the inverse of the earnings yield, so it's operating income on, or it's enterprise value on operating income. Um, why and it's sort of like you could think about it like a like an industrial strength price earnings multiple, and it's why that works so well at finding deeply undervalued stocks. And so then I just discussed other guys who, uh, Icahn, who's a who's a Carl Icahn, who's a um, activist investor over here. David Einhorn, who's an activist, and Dan Lobb, how they've kind of used this metric, or I think they've used this metric to find really undervalued stocks and make lots of money doing it. Yeah, I've got to say, some of those stories were fascinating, especially um, Dan Lobb and his letters that he wrote when he filed his 13D notices. I thought that was a, that was a great way to sort of influence company management. Very clever, right? Yeah. It was a very clever. Yeah, really taking advantage of his opportunity there. So I've read the book and I've got to say, I, I really enjoyed it. I thought you wrote it in a way that, that really made me understand exactly how you thought about value investing and, and I found it really valuable. I guess, Thank you. I guess the driver or the mechanism that you talk about that leads these deep value stocks to appreciate in value is mean reversion. So can you explain um, mean reversion in an investing context and how that actually drives these um, extremely cheap stocks to realize their value? Yeah, great question. Um, mean reversion is that you find mean reversion is is a is an idea that you find through lots of different disciplines. Like you find it in you find it in mathematics. Uh, it's the law of large numbers in mathematics, but basically, in a, it's in gambling as well. In finance, um, what it means is if you find you find these sort of uh, undervalued companies and overvalued companies sort of tend to go back to about the average valuation, the kind of track back to average valuation, and that's mean reversion. It's it's this movement back towards the average. Um, you find it if if you find an overvalued stock market, they tend to kind of underperform, and undervalued stock markets tend to outperform. Um, really fast growing economies tend to slow down and, and slowly growing economies tend to speed up. Slow growing companies tend to speed up and fast growing companies tend to slow down. You find it everywhere. You look very profitable companies become less profitable. Um, unprofitable companies tend to become more profitable. There are some conditions around that. It's not, it's not true that a company that's listed on a stock exchange that's going to go and drill for uh, gold somewhere in the Australian outback is going to become a profitable company. That's, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that companies that do have a history of kind of making a bit of money, if they're currently not making money, then there's a reasonably good chance that given a kind of better turn of the business cycle, they'll start doing a little bit better. So that's kind of what I'm looking for, something that has done pretty well in the past that's having a tough time now. And often when you find that if the business isn't doing well, the stock's been absolutely crushed. So you get these things when the business doesn't look great, the stock is really, really cheap. And then if they recover, if they survive, and so I'm looking for the things that will help them survive, if they do survive, you find that the business does a little bit better and then the stock does a lot better because the, the discount is sort of taken out of the stock and the business is doing better. You get those two things pushing together, you, you, you do pretty well in the stock. So that's, that's mean reversion. Yeah, okay. So for, for companies specifically, you sort of talk about, in the book you talk about, if a company is, is seeing extremely large profits, then competitors will enter that industry and so their profits will shrink because of the increased competition and vice versa. When an industry is doing poorly, the sort of struggling companies will be shaken out of the market because they can't keep up. And then the, that lessening of competition will allow those struggling companies to revert to the mean. H how do you ensure that the, the companies that you're buying aren't going to be the ones that will get shaken out by the competitive dynamics? And, and you're, you're not accidentally buying the ones that will go bankrupt rather than the ones that will revert to the mean? That's a really good question, and that really is the heart of what I do. That's the that's the, the hardest thing to do. But there are things that there's just common sense things that, that you would look for. If they're carrying a lot of debt and they're not making much money, then they're going to really struggle to sort of survive. If they are kind of if they've got some cash and they've got some cash flow, 
then that's the kind of business that can survive a downturn in the market. So those are the ones that I'm looking for. I want, if not cash on the balance sheet, at least kind of strong operating earnings, cash flow kind of flight. So operating earnings is probably, it's the accounting version of cash flow. Um, so you're looking for, you want cash still coming in. And then the other things that I look for, if, if you're looking for a good management, you're looking for a company that's buying back stock. So little buybacks aren't very interesting, but material buybacks are very interesting. And there's some research about that. So material, like a big buyback uh, typically indicates a few things. One of them is that management is thinking about the shareholders. They're taking advantage of an undervalued company to buy back some stock. Two, they've got the cash there to buy the, the stock back because companies that, that don't have the cash there just can't do a buyback. And that's, that's the sort of thing you want to try and avoid. If they don't have any flexibility to buy the, back, the stock back when they're undervalued, then they've done the wrong thing at some stage in the business cycle. So it indicates a few things. Management uh, know what they're doing. They're, they're kind of helping the shareholders and the, the cash is there to do the buyback and it's undervalued enough that they can, they can kind of do it. So when you get those things together with an undervalued stock, that's a pretty good indication that, that the stock's going to do something good over the next few years. Yeah, okay. That's great. Um, so I, then I assume the other key part of this uh, investing philosophy as opposed to sort of Buffett and Greenblatt is that you need to time your selling right because with Buffett and Greenblatt, a big part of their sort of magic formula or you know looking for moats is that you can buy and hold these companies for you know throughout business cycles and they'll keep compounding. Um, so how, how do you know when to sell? Like, when do you know that these companies have realized their value or um, are there any sort of key indicators that sort of show that it's time to get out? It's one of the toughest things to sort of figure out um, and it's influenced by a lot of things. If you're, in, if you, if you're taxable, um, you have to be careful that, you know, you've got long-term, short-term capital gains. It, it can be it, it, the tax bite can be material to your return, so you have to be you have to be a little bit careful about that. But sort of ignoring the taxes, um, undervalued companies. One of the nice things about value investing, one of the nice things about undervaluation, just pure undervaluation, not sort of worrying about high, how high quality the business is, is that if you find something that's undervalued, typically it takes about three to five years for the undervaluation to work its way out. So what that means is that five years later, the company sort of only finally getting to its its value the very vast bulk of the return comes in the first few years because that's that's where the rubber band is stretched the furthest away from um intrinsic value and so it springs back pretty quickly if you get it right but then five years later you still find that they outperform um what i do in my deep value portfolio is that i've got an idea about intrinsic value and I'm watching what that intrinsic value is doing quarter to quarter in the States because that's how often they report uh, half to half in Australia because Australian companies report on the half. And you're just sort of looking at what's intrinsic value doing? Is intrinsic value going up? Is it going down? Is it stable? Where is the price relative to that intrinsic value? When the price is sort of catching up to intrinsic value, I'm probably becoming less interested in that company because they, you know, the stock gets bigger in your portfolio and it gets riskier as it gets bigger because it's getting closer to value. So I, I often trim companies back and I'll add to them if they fall again. And I find that uh, there's quite a lot of return in sort of trading around that. And it's something we do regularly. If something's falling, we'll buy some more. If it's growing, we might take some off the table. And, um, Finally, if it gets to a point where we think it's fully valued and um, we've got better ideas around, so we've got some stuff that's really cheap that we really want to we really want to buy a big chunk of, we'll probably finally exit and then move towards that thing that we think is really cheap. So that's the process. It's it's uh, it's not really uh, quantitative. It's kind of, it's a little bit more. There's a little bit more art to it than there is science. And I've, I've got no idea kind of how successful we are at, with it because it's it's a tough thing to do. But that's that's basically what we're trying to do. Fair enough. Um, so on top of the book, The Acquirer is Multiple, you also uh, have the website, theacquirersmultiple.com. Can you, can you talk about uh, a little bit about what you're doing there? Because I, I found it really just 
it's a great resource to sort of understand in practice what what you're talking about in the book and to see some of the companies that or well, i mean i was surprised to see some of the companies that were sort of springing up um in that stock screener yeah so one of the when i when i found uh when i kind of had done this research and i went back to greenblatt's magic formula site because he's got some free stock picks on his magic formula site uh, what I really wanted to do was just look at the ones that were cheap on an operating earnings, you know, an acquirer's multiple basis, and I couldn't find a way to kind of do that successfully on the site. So I thought I'll just build my own. Um, it was, it's a difficult process to kind of track down the data and to track down the data and uh, get it get it up on the site like that. But um, what it does is it screens, there's a free screener on the site, and it screens uh, all U.S. stocks and it looks for the ones that are cheapest on an acquirer's multiple basis. We do some other statistical things in the background. So we, we look, we make sure that they're not, um, we use these statistical measures to find financial distress and uh, earnings manipulation and fraud. And we kick those stocks out. We also kick out stocks that are too heavily shorted because the research shows that sometimes the, the short sellers are smart money. You know, they've got a pretty good idea about what isn't going to perform very well in the future. It's often hard to short on the basis of short interest because there's a lot of guys trying to borrow the stock. It makes them very expensive to short, but um, they don't want you don't want to own them long because they don't perform very well. So we kick those out, and then we have a few other measures that uh, I don't really tell anybody about because it's some of our secret <laughs> sauce. We just kick out things that are too expensive, basically. And so the things that are left are cheap, generating plenty of plenty of. Ca- accounting cash flow relative to what you're actually paying. And statistically, as a portfolio, they have tended to work very well kind of over a long period of time. So the site is, uh, I've, got a, I've got a partner in the site, Johnny Hopkins, who runs it from Australia. Um, he's, he, he's a great uh, investor in his own right, and he kind of digs up all these great stories that sort of talk about, illustrate the ideas of what we're trying to do. So if anybody's interested, you can go to the Acquirers Multiple, just the acquirersmultiple.com, sign up to the uh, sign up to the screener, and you can see in the top thousand companies in the states, the cheapest thirty. And it's interesting the stuff that goes in there. So I, last year, uh, Apple came into the screener, mm. and I was kind of shocked because it's it's a stock that just just coincidentally it was a, when I first published quantitative value in 2012. Um, in order to promote it, we had to write up a stock pick. Because we, you know, we've spent the whole book saying, don't pick individual stocks, pick base, <laughs> pick pick portfolio. Yeah. And then, of course, the first thing that somebody wants is a stock write up. So we wrote up this, we wrote up Apple because we thought that was, I think it was the one of the cheapest stocks around in the large cap universe at the time. So we wrote that up. Of course, it goes on to perform really well, uh, and, and part of that was because there were activists involved, Icon and Einhorn both got involved, and I write about that how that all happened in Acquirers Multiple, and then last year. Um, I think it was about April last year. It came back into the screen. I kind of couldn't believe it that it's so, such a big, well-known, you know, great brand, really well-respected company. So much cash on its yeah, balance yeah. sheet, and it came back in. It was like the 20th cheapest stock in the U.S. in the, in that large cap universe. So I tweeted it out again. Whatever it was at the time, I think it was about it was 80 bucks or something. And it's basically it's in the it's up sort of 80% since then. So it's, it's a good screener and it picks up some great stocks along the way. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, so on the website, you've got uh, all, all US stocks and Canadian stocks. Uh, are there plans to do Australian stocks at some, at some point in the future? I'd love to do it because I love the Aussie stock market and, uh, and I'd love to be invested there a little bit more. Um, the problem is that tracking down the Aussie data, to, uh, tracking down the Aussie data to uh, to sort of put into the screen because it's very expensive. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. It's something that I will do in the future. It just it's it's sort of a it's not an immediate project. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. So I guess from from your experience, because you started your fund in Australia and then moved it over to America, do, what are the big differences that you've noticed between the two markets and specifically for value investing? Are there, are there any major differences? Yeah, the, the Australian market is uh, very he- so. The index in Australia is fifty percent in uh, financials, and that's banks and insurance, which is which is massively overweight. Mm. If you look around, so the MSCI world is the global stock market index. 
uh, banks don't come anywhere near 50%. I think they sit around sort of 13 or 15, something like that. And then um, basic materials, which is that sort of miners, they make up another 13% in Australia. And that, that's so that means that the Australian index is sort of two thirds financials and basic materials, which is a very unusual mix. Yeah. Um, and the things that, you know, that tend to be better businesses. So those are tough business. Those are very cyclical businesses. Typically, Australia hasn't had a recession in a long time. So the banks haven't looked like cyclicals. But if Australia has a genuine recession, then they might find that there are some holes in some of that balance sheet. So the banks in Australia might look a little bit, a fair bit weaker. And that's a big chunk of the index. Um, the funny thing about the Australian index, I think it's still below where it was in 2007. And so it's been a tough kind of period to be an investor in a purely Australian you know, if you're only investing domestically. Mm. The US market is a different kind of market. It's very, very big. Uh, it's like half of the global market capitalization. And, and it has a lot more uh, consumer discretionary, uh, consumer staples, consumer product companies, you know, like Googles and Apples and things like that that are kind of interesting from a uh, business perspective. So uh, Australia's uh, infotech sector is 0.5% of the index. MSCI World is 13%. So Australia's sort of underweight uh, infotech and things like that. So it's, just, it's a different market. The other thing is that the Australian stock market tends to be a little bit more shareholder friendly. You can get proposals put to the company. You can circulate documents and do things like that. that and none of those things exist in the States. They have this dual class, dual share class structures in the States where, you know, the, the founders own these A shares that vote a million times to the other shares or, yeah, or yeah. the B shares don't vote at all. That's pretty common over here. And it's hard to kind of get management to listen to you if you hold a lot of B shares that don't vote. Whereas in Australia, on the ASX, you're not allowed to do that. You only have the ASX only allows ordinary shares and all ordinary shares basically have the same voting rights. So that means that the activists in the States are like they're a totally different breed to the activists in Australia. They're kind of weaponized, you know, like armadillo, you know, just evolved in a different way. And which is why you see the Dan Loeb style where they, you know, they write the really rude letters and Carl Icahn who'll just get on a call and rip their faces off, <laughs> stuff like that. They have to be a bit tougher over here. But it's something that you have to bear in mind as an investor. You have to be careful when you're in these things. And, and I've been caught recently in a stock where we kind of misread what management was doing a little bit. Um, the, the, the company is Sina, S-I-N-A is the, is the ticker over here. They own a big chunk of another company called Weibo, which is the China Chinese uh, it's kind of a chat thing in, in, in China. So it's a situation that I like because you can buy a whole lot of Sina and you can hedge out the Weibo by selling it short. And then if the stock market crashes, you've got this natural kind of arbitrage short in there. And the idea is that you're getting this chunk of Sina free and if the if the two stocks kind of trended together, which is what we were hoping would happen, then you make some money and eventually you just take the position off and you've, you've, you've had a little arbitrage. Um, what they had been doing is Cena had been sort of spinning off bits of Weibo, which naturally closes out your short. In this instance, though, the stock had continued to get wider and the, 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 the spread was something like 70%, which is very, very wide in something like this. Then this American activist firm, Aristea, showed up and said, we want to get two directors on the board. We're going to close the gap. We're going to pay out these things, pay out this uh, Weibo holding. Um, the management fought them really hard and it, Aristea was defeated about two weeks ago at, uh, at the shareholder meeting. And um, immediately the Cena uh, directors issued these preference shares that basically cement them into this company. So they're doing, you know, they're, they're doing, they're, they're, uh, you know, they lend themselves money to buy Cena shares when they're cheap, rather than just going and buying it back for all the other for all the other shareholders. So, you know, you could never get away with that kind of stuff in Australia. Yeah. Um, how, how do they? Is that just allowed in America that you can issue yourself preference shares? It's a, well, they're not issuing it to themselves, but they're just issuing them, which uh, and they're convertible, and they. It, it, we've basically sold out of this position because it hasn't really worked out, but it's. It's a, it's a, just a different kind of regime in the States. You have to be sort of prepared to look after yourself a little bit more, whereas in Australia, um, ASIC and the ASX are much more kind of – they pay more attention to these sort of things. So um, they're, they're, the regime in Australia is just more shareholder-friendly. So 
that's sort of that's the main difference. Um, you just got to be a little bit more careful when you're investing in the states, sort of who the management is and who you're invested alongside, because you want to be alongside somebody who's an in, a big engaged shareholder who's prepared to kick up a stink if something happens that they don't like. But you also just want to be beside in with management who who are shareholder friendly. Yeah, yeah. So uh, another another thing that I've found really interesting of late, and it seems to be that at as we approach any market top, there, there are people who talk about the death of value investing. We, we our most recent interview, we interviewed an Australian in, investor, Michael D, who said he was a value investor, but he doesn't think the, that model works anymore. Recently, um, David Ironhorn has said something similar or he's questioned the utility of value investing. Do you, do you think this is just almost a natural part of the market cycle and, you know, they'll come to their senses at some point or has something structurally changed after the JFC? Yeah, I think, I think it's naturally part of the cycle that when the market gets, you know, when the market gets, I, I don't know how close we are to, to the crash. I mean, if you'd asked me five years ago, is the market overvalued and will it crash soon? I'd have said yes. Um, so I've been wrong for, you know, at least five years, maybe longer than that. So I'm, I'm no great picker of what the stock market's going to do. But um, yeah, it, it, it's something that I have seen, uh, you know, in the late 1990s when dot coms were all the rage, there were magazine covers that said, has Warren Buffett lost his touch in 2007? It had been a pretty good run for value up to 2007. But but again, it was just easier to be in kind of the, the, the more glamorous stocks. And what happens when the market gets like this? Um, the bigger a company is, uh, the sort of more momentum it has. So, if you're if you're a value guy, you're naturally buying things that are smaller because you know if if two companies have got a hundred million dollars in earnings and one's trading on a PE of fifty, and one's trading on a PE of five, the one's trading on a PE of fifty is ten times bigger, yeah, yeah. and it's those ones that um, everybody wants to be in, and the one that's trading on a PE of five, no one wants to touch with a barge pole, and that's the sort of thing that I'm trying to. Buy. And it just doesn't get any love in a market like this. Yeah. So I guess that would be exacerbated by indexes and passive investing these days as well, because as well, they would naturally skew towards the companies with higher market caps. Well, that's that's true. And that's that's been the argument that ETFs have had a big influence on this market going the way it is. And, and is that a structural change to the market that means value investing will never work again? One of the things that I've seen... Uh, over two previous market tops, and I don't know if this is a market top, but we're probably closer to the top than we are to the bottom, is that whenever value investing starts looking like the dumbest thing around, and values look pretty dumb through this cycle, I think it's, if I if I look at my back tests, uh, basically since June 2009, value just hasn't looked, value's underperformed, and that's a really long period of time. It's seven years and another quarter and probably a, a little bit more. It's the longest period of time since the late 1990s, and the underperformance in the late 1990s was much uh, greater, but it was over a much shorter period of time. This has sort of been a, a really drawn out, sucky period for value, which is great because I started being a value investor about <laughs> about the same time. So yeah. <laughs> it's underperformed the entire period. My wife is very forgiving, she, but she must think I'm a complete idiot. You know, we could have just put it all in the stock market and gone to the beach. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but so yeah, I I think it's cyclical. And I do think that at some stage, there's a reckoning for the stock market and then value starts looking like a much better strategy. But yeah, I've got no, there's, nothing, there's nothing that I can point to that proves that other than sort of that's my intuition and I've seen it a few times before. Yeah, I guess you're, you're backtesting in the acquirer's multiple. Uh, it was pretty hard to argue with though because you sort of went back to the mid-60s and backtested, I think it was with five different strategies. Um, including one just following the market, um, one chasing growth, and then Joel Greenblatt, uh, and then the acquirer's multiple. Uh, and, you know, your back testing was, uh, you, you exponentially beat the market. So that, right. that's got a point to this value, having some value, I guess. It's one of the funny things, like the reason that value works over the long term is because it doesn't work regularly in the short term. And there are lots of people who just, can't stand the underperformance. And look, I'm one of them. I hate underperforming, especially because you look like an idiot and you're doing all this stuff and the dumb index, which, you know, they're just buying the biggest, <laughs> that's doing so much better. Yeah, you know, it's yeah. hard. It's hard on the old ego to sit there thinking that you're doing anything at all. 
but I do think that it's it's the time of the market, and I think that the long term um, returns to value are so strong that just because the last sort of seven years haven't worked so well, it, it's not long enough for me to write it off. And I've seen longer periods of underperformance in those back tests. You can, you know, it happened in the in the sixties, it's happened in the seventies, and often out of that really long period of uh, underperformance, you get a really good period of outperformance. So that's what I'm holding out for. Yeah. How, how do you keep, how do you get your investors to keep the faith? Because, you know, they, they would get your know, quarterly updates and they would have their, you know, they could see how the market's going and, it, you know, value investing has to be a long-term philosophy. But as sort of Seth Kleiman writes, like a lot of Wall Street is, you know, this institutional performance derby where everyone's compared <laughs> on their last quarter. So, so how do you how do you get that message that you gotta you gotta stick with me for the long term through to your investors? We report on a monthly basis, um, so that makes it right. that does make it tough. And there's a yeah. there's a lot of noise on a monthly basis, particularly the last month. Uh, has been very tough for for whatever reason. Value has just sort of collapsed a little bit over the last month, and the market's still been quite strong. Part of it is educating them. That's why I write the books because I want people to understand, you know, what it is that I'm doing, why we're buying these really ugly companies, and you know that underperformance isn't unusual, that it regularly occurs, and also to say, look, this is a long-term approach. Um, over the long term, over 20 or 30 years, this is a better place to be even though in the short term it's pretty painful. Um, that still doesn't help. You know, there's still, there's still some churn. People come in and people go out. But that's the, that's the argument that we make. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully they all pick up the acquirer's multiple and, and give it a read. <laughs> hopefully everybody does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> one, one other thing that I found really interesting in your book, um, and you refer to them as broken legs. And essentially they're, you know, the facts about a certain business that make you say, wait, but, you know, I'm not going to invest in it for this reason or that reason. And you, you sort of talk about how you have to eliminate that thinking from your investing. And because, you know, you'll always be able to find a reason not to invest, but this value system works best if you just ignore those broken legs. H- how have well, you found... This... Yeah, sorry, yeah so that there's this, there's this idea... Um... Basically, there's some research going back to the, the early 80s, um, maybe even early 70s, um, where they've been comparing the performance of simple algorithms. So an algorithm is just, it's not like a computer program. It's just a decision. You know, you might have six decision gates in a row. Um, should I, yes or no, go or don't go. And then you get to the end. And if you're, if you, you've done some analysis on this thing, so, you know, you, you go to the racetrack and you look at, you know, you don't bet in the first race. That might be your first decision gate. Your second decision gate might be bet in the last, you know, bet in the last race. Is it the last race? Yes. Okay, it's time to bet. Is the favorite top weight? Yes. Maybe time to bet on the favorite. You know, it's something like that. It's just a series of decisions that you make that you that you have no influence on. And they found that um, basically if you apply these rules, um, you tend to do better than even experts in these different areas. And it's everything from picking the right wine bottle to um, working out whether somebody's got depression, you know, so it's in, in medicine, um, in the stock market. It's, in, it's across all of these different disciplines. And so they've come up with this thing. It's called the golden rule. Um, basically, these simple uh, algorithms beat the expert decisions. And one of the ideas that comes out of this, you know, why is that the case? And the reason is that... Um, Experts tend to exercise their discretion to override models too often. And the, the, the way that they kind of, the example that they give is say you have some algorithm that tells you whether Johnny is going to go to the cinema on a Friday night. And in your algorithm, you might have something like what kind of movie is showing? Is it is it an action movie? Is it a romance movie? You might look at the weather, you know, is it a, is the night raining? So you, you might say if it's if it's raining and it's a romantic movie, he's not going to go. If it's a dry night and it's an action movie, he is going to go. But you get this extra bit of information. He's got a broken leg. Surely you should be able to factor that into your model to say he's not going to go to the theater, even though all of these other things are lining up telling you that he is going to go. And the answer is that you shouldn't do it. And the reason is that we find too many broken legs. We find too many ways that 
we want to override the model. We try to exercise our discretion too often. Um, and it's particularly apt if you're a deep value investor because every single one of these companies looks like it's got a broken leg. You know, they've all got something wrong with them. There's a reason not to invest. But you just got to keep on saying to yourself, the reason not to invest is why the opportunity exists in the first place. That's why it's cheap. And if it's cheap enough and you think it can survive, it just needs a little bit of good luck to sort of do very well. And that's what I've found over a long period of doing this. You find something that's really busted on a business on a business basis, but the balance sheet looks okay and it looks like it's going to survive. You know, good things do tend to happen to these stocks, something good, you know, they get a little bit of luck and all of a sudden you're sort of off to the races. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because it is quite a counterintuitive idea that experts shouldn't trust their sort of expertise to, to put a, like a layer on top of these, you know, stock screening algorithms or how, however they assess what's, what's good value. But I mean, you know, as, as you said, the back testing sort of proves it that you just got to stick to the system. Right. Yeah. So one one other thing that I wanted to ask you. Uh, so in in your book, you in when talking about mean reversion, you talk about um, how Buffett talked about how corporate profits would revert back to the mean. He said that they wouldn't stay above six percent for any sustained period of time. But what, right. what what we've seen is that they, they have, a, have had an unbelievable right. staying power. So is this an exception of to mean reversion or is this just an extremely long cycle that, that we're in the middle of? Well, that's, a, that's the million dollar question. Yeah. <laughs> my intuition is that, it, that it's cyclical, but there's no evidence for that. At the moment, it's looking pretty secular. But I think that you can, you don't, you don't have to think very long to kind of figure out why, um, why it has happened. If you... If you flood the economy with cheap money, and if you make um, you make it really easy for companies to raise money on the stock market or to borrow money, then things that are marginal projects that just wouldn't get a get a look in in any kind of normal market tend to be there doing quite well. You know, and it, and it it's hard to kind of see the relationships between. You know, sometimes it's it's uh, so. For example, you know, Snapchat has gone public, right? Snapchat doesn't make much money at all; loses mm. a lot of money. But Snapchat pays uh, Amazon Web Services four hundred million dollars a year to be the kind of back end of Snapchat. So, Amazon Web Services is making four hundred million dollars that it wouldn't otherwise make because Snapchat has raised money from venture capitalists and the public now. And so that's a sort of an example of. You just you can't see how the money flows through these companies to make other companies look better than they would otherwise look. You know, so the venture capitalists have been able to raise a lot of money. They've been able to invest in a lot of these companies that are pretty marginal. All of that kind of and those companies then spend money with other companies. All of that kind of working together, all that cheap money that they can raise and borrow, that is then invested in these other companies, makes them look more profitable than they might otherwise look. So I think that cheap money flows through to that profit line and competition will eventually come in to eat that eat that away and for you, they just it's just it's too easy to make that much money and not expect that you're going to get somebody else who wants to come in and make that amount of money so um, i think it's cyclical yeah. um, but you know i do acknowledge that it doesn't look that way yeah <laughs> we'll see let's see if main reversion holds so, yeah, I'm, I, there, there aren't a lot of guys left who, who, who are cheering for mean reversion, i yeah. got to say. So I'll either look like a, I'm either like going to be cast out on an island or it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to start working. Yeah, yeah. So, Toby, look, we, we've reached the, our final three questions um, that we ask all of, that we finish all of our interviews with. Um, but just before we cool. get there, can you tell our listeners, you know, if they're interested in uh, reading some more stuff that you've written or following you on social media, where can they find you? Um, the new book is called The Acquirer's Multiple. It's uh, it's in Australia. I think it's only available on Kindle at the moment, but it's in the it's in Amazon.com.au, um, or you can buy the the a paperback through Amazon in the states. Um, I'm on Twitter at greenbacked.com. It's a funny spelling. It's G-R-E-E-N-B-A-C-K-D, or you can just search my name, Tobias Carlisle. It comes up. Or Acquirers Multiple. So that's the website where acquirersmultiple.com, that's the website that has the stock picks and, and Johnny writes, uh, put some good articles up there every single day. So those are the easiest ways to get. Or you can shoot me an email, uh, tobias at acquirersmultiple.com. Perfect. 
All right, well, let's get into our final three questions. So, first of all, what book or books do you consider must-reads? Well, ex- ignoring my own. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, the uh, you know, the analysis and the intelligent investor are really tough books to read, but I think they they are worthwhile if you sort of they, you get the most recent version of security analysis because they've got intros by well-known investors and the intelligent investor just sort of describes the idea of value investing. Um, I love the snowball, which is about Warren Buffett. Um, just looking at my bookshelf now, what else, what else is great? Oh, what works on wall street is another Epic. Uh, that's written by Jim O'Shaughnessy. He's a quant. He sort of went through and he looked at all of these different strategies for investing in the stock market. And then he shows the actual returns to those, those strategies. Um, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting Jim a few times. He's a really good bloke. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll we'll link all those books in um in our show notes. There's some good ones there, and I, I haven't heard of that Jim O'Shaughnessy one, so that's definitely one I'm going to add to my list. It's very good. Yeah. Great. So, second question: What is your go-to source for investing information? Twitter. I love Twitter. Uh, I spend a lot of time kind of hunting around. They're really smart guys, and they're asking questions about stocks, asking questions about strategies. So. I follow um, lots of interesting investors. They're not they're not famous at all. They're just sort of guys on there who are, um, are there any, like me, just sort of plugging uh, away. Uh, are there any must follows that that you would sort of recommend to jump on Twitter and follow? Yeah, there's uh, Shadow Stock uh, at Journal of Value. He's he's great. He's an old school kind of uh, quant deep value guy. So I love a lot of the work he does. He'll have he'll just run some interesting screen and he'll dig up. Um, you know, here are here are ten stocks that are really cheap on an acquirer's multiple basis that are buying back stock, and then he'll just give them to you. So he's always really good. So that's one of my favourite ones, I think. That's great. Yeah, I've, I've found Twitter is just pe- people are so willing to share information and stock ideas and thoughts on markets. It it, it is really just an unbelievably good resource. It's good value. Yeah. <laughs> it's free. <laughs> yeah, very much. Now, all right, third and final question. What advice, and this can be investing or otherwise, would you give your younger self when you were just starting out uh, in markets and as an investor? It's going to take a lot longer to get going than you think it is, and you probably need more money uh, than you think you do. I, I, I really wanted to, you know, I'd have been more than happy to kind of go and work for, for somebody else in the States. It's just hard with, uh, you know, an Australian um an Australian degree and uh, not a lot of, <laughs> excuse me, not a lot of US experience. Um, but as it happens, that didn't happen. So I sort of started my own thing earlier than I should have. So it just takes a lot of time and patience. It's, it, you know, you can run into these periods like we've just seen seven years of kind of value underperformance, which makes it tough to be a value investor. So you need a lot of patience and you need some capital behind you to kind of make it work. That's the, that's kind of the best advice I can give. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Just, I think I think for probably all areas of life, it's going to take longer. <laughs> Got to be patient. Yeah, but yeah, you'll come good in the end. All right, all right. Well, Toby, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I can't recommend the acquirers multiple highly enough. So I, I reckon everyone should go out and get it. And then if they're feeling game, uh, deep value is another one that I've heard great things about. Um, But thank you for coming on and joining us today. Thanks so much for having me, Alec. Really love the questions and it was great chatting. Equity mates and the people appearing in this program may have positions in the companies mentioned. This is general advice only. Please speak to a financial professional to understand how it may pertain to your individual situation.